Now I want to talk about two-dimensional acceleration. And again, this is something that we've talked about a little bit, but in chapter one, we typically dealt with situations where each part of our motion could be simplified down to one-dimensional motion. Now we're talking about motion that is inherently two-dimensional, and we get some new ideas because of that. So you can imagine that this motion diagram maybe represents a child skating in some sort of community skate park where there's a hill, a little bit of a, of a um, what's that called, a pipe, me and my, my hip terminology here, and then another hill. So if we just look at this initial component here, that's one-dimensional motion. This is nice and simple to think about, that our velocity is going in one dimension, and again, if this was some sort of hill, we could actually call this the perpendicular direction, and our acceleration is also pointed in the same direction. And since the slope of our hill is this constant, it's uniform, this simplifies down to an inclined plane problem, and we see that our acceleration is constant. Since the acceleration points in the same direction as the velocity, we see that our velocity vector is increasing. So this is old news. We see the same thing happening over here, where this is also one dimensional, but now our velocity vector is pointing to the right. Note that this is a different one dimensional system where I might now call this my perpendicular direction. These are separate things, I can't combine them together. And now my velocity vector is pointing up along the ramp and my acceleration vector is pointing down. That means, since these are what I would call anti-parallel, your velocity vector is decreasing in magnitude, and eventually your object will stop. So that part is old news. What we need to think about in the middle now, this is inherently two-dimensional. We can't simplify this down to one dimension, and we now need to think about what that means for the acceleration. Now thinking through this is going to be a little bit tricky and we are going to come back to these ideas when we get to circular motion because what's actually happening in the bottom is effectively a circle. Now it's not necessarily uniform circular motion, which will be the first thing we talk about, but thinking about acceleration and circular motion, it can be a little bit tricky. So we want to think about how our velocity vector is changing. Remember that the acceleration vector is equal to just your change in velocity over time. So all I have to do is figure out how my vector is changing, and then my acceleration vector will be in the same direction as that. So in order to do that, if we just want to think about these two vectors, remember that delta v is going to equal v final minus v initial. Those are vectors. And so we see that v final starts here, goes over, and then one thing that I want to show, right, v final in this case is this one, right? Negative v initial is just the inverse of that vector, right? So that had been flipped down, so what we're doing is drawing it backwards like that. Okay, so lots of lines on this picture. So then, once you add your negative v initial, remember that our total one gets drawn from the uh, tail of our first vector to the tip of the second one. So it is that little vector there. Now, that's giving the direction. It's not giving the magnitude. And so then this becomes that, right? So what you notice is that this acceleration vector is not in the direction of either of these vectors. The difference between these two vectors is mostly in what direction they're pointed. And so this vector, this acceleration vector here, is almost perpendicular to these two vectors. So whenever you have a perpendicular component to your acceleration, that changes the direction. If you have a parallel component, that changes the speed, right? We knew that from 1D. But in 2D, the perpendicular component changes your direction. In the second case here, which is shown in the little picture to the right, I'm going to not draw lots of lines on it this time, 
that now when we take v final and we subtract v initial, it actually is exactly perpendicular. So the length of these two vectors hasn't changed at all, that it's only the perpendicular component. And I'm going to summarize that in, a, uh, in two slides. But again, the most important thing here to realize is that when you have this situation where two-dimensional motion can't be simplified down to a velocity and acceleration vector that are either parallel or anti-parallel, your acceleration vector can have perpendicular components, and that actually changes the direction. So that's the hugely important aspect of 2D acceleration, and we'll dwell on that a little bit more. One of the important things here is to not get too confused about the process, that again, all we're doing to find the acceleration vector is actually subtracting our initial velocity from our final velocity. So if you look through these steps, these look just like some earlier steps when we found the acceleration vector for a one-dimensional system in chapter one. The only difference now is that our velocity vectors are in 2D, so when we do the subtraction, we get an answer that could be in any direction. And remember that when we get that delta V, that's the direction of our acceleration. So again, remember that you find this acceleration vector by doing vector subtraction. My hope is that you will get a conceptual feel for just based on how the motion is occurring, what the acceleration is. But if you ever get really confused, just do the vector subtraction, and that will give you your acceleration vector. Okay, now I want to come back to this idea of the perpendicular and parallel components of acceleration. Now to really understand this, you're ho you should hopefully be okay at breaking vectors into components. And again, this comes down to trig, that we can think of this as the hypotenuse of a right triangle, where my right angle is here, and I have two components. Now in this case, I am not using x and y. I am using parallel and perpendicular, a notation that I've shown you multiple times, because this is one of the places where we really want it. We want to talk about what is parallel to our velocity vector and what is perpendicular to our velocity vector. We don't necessarily care about x and y, at least in this moment. And so any component that's parallel to our velocity vector, this is simplifying down to a one-dimensional situation. You know that acceleration parallel to your velocity in the same direction makes your velocity increase. Okay, so this parallel component is only changing its speed. It makes your velocity vector increase or decrease in magnitude, but it does not change the direction that your velocity vector points. Right? In one-dimensional motion, we never worried about our accelerations and velocities suddenly changing direction because they always pointed in the same one. We had one dimension to worry about. But now we have this new perpendicular component, and that changes the direction. Now, one way to think about this is if you are, well, there's a couple of activities you can do in real life that, that might help a little bit, but imagine that, you know, you're trying to walk in a straight line and that there's, you know, a wind blowing you to the side, right? You're going to turn a little bit. Now, if for whatever reason the wind started blowing that way, you would turn more. So what actually makes you change direction is something perpendicular to how you're moving. So that's what's happening here. The perpendicular component to the velocity vector changes its direction, the parallel changes its speed. And again, we're going to have to consider this moment by moment, really. So even if we have a constant acceleration, if our velocity vector is therefore changing in direction, the perpendicular and parallel components will be changing as well. So in thinking through, going back to our original trajectory with our velocity vector, what's happening at a given moment, we would have had to look at two separate velocity to, uh, points to understand what our acceleration was doing. Now in this case, if you're just told what your acceleration is doing, you'd break it into your parallel component and your perpendicular component. Note that in this case, we see that this is anti-parallel, so this must be slowing down. 
And again, I see that just because my parallel component is pointed in the opposite direction. Now this is pointing down-ish, and so this is changing the direction, and so that's going to bring this tip more down. And again, we can see that that's what's happening since at a later point, it was pointing to the right. So that did bring the tip down. And again, without time information, I don't necessarily know how long it is, but I know at least at this point, it was slowing down. So this is really helpful to decompose, to break into components, your acceleration vector into parallel and perpendicular components. Now when we do the math, we are normally actually going to be working in x and y components. That's a little bit less helpful to just think about what's happening, but that's where the math is going to work better. So if we break our acceleration vector into x and y components, we say, okay, yes, it has an x and a y component, but in this case, we can't just say how that's necessarily changing our velocity. So this is the best way to think about how your velocity vector is changing. But this is normally what we're going to see just from the math. And the reason that that's true is because, for instance, if this was an, an up-down type of problem where we have the gravity, and I'll say the acceleration due to gravity in that negative y direction, that's giving us that acceleration. We know that. Now maybe this is, maybe this is a, an acceleration due to the wind. I don't know. And so there you go. You have two components of your acceleration, and then we would have to think about how that impacts your velocity. That's actually a pretty challenging problem, which is why it's better to think about it in terms of parallel and perpendicular.